Um, we're going to go around and introduce ourselves so everyone um, who doesn't know us can can meet us and those online can introduce themselves as well. I'm Erin LaFramboise. I'm a commissioner from Browning. I'm Jenny Staff with the State Library. My name is Ann Kish. I work at the University of Montana Western. Bruce Newell, commissioner from Helena. Kenny Norlich, uh, commissioner from MSC Bozeman. Good morning, uh, State Superintendent Elsie Arnson. Um, Marla Stark with the State Library. Ken Wall with, from Missoula, Christian from Missoula. Um, Melissa Williams with the State Library. Evan Hammer with the State Library. Stacey Armstrong, Governor's Office. Jessica Edward, State Library. Jackie Cranko, State Library. John Finn, Montana Library Association. And online. Just Joe Flick, I'm with the your Montana State Library. Thank you, Joe. And um, <clears throat> is there any need to make any adjustments to our agenda today? I don't believe so. Okay, so we'll start off with the staff longevity pin. And I'm really happy to introduce Jackie Crapo, who is going to receive her five-year pin, and it's going to be presented by her supervisor, Jessica Edwards. Um, <laughs> so Jackie's been with the library for five years. Um, she is a reader's advisor for the Talking Book Library. And she's also our machine lending agent. So she actually puts together the machines to go out and do things every day and check the ones who come, that come back in. And she manages the volunteers who clean and fix those machines. Um, for a reader's advisor, she talks to patrons, she talks to all patrons, but in particular, she works with patrons who have the last names that start with H through O. Um, and she talks to multiple people a day, getting them new books to go out, fixing the machines, rec recommending new books, just chatting with them. Um, and she recently represented the State Library at the National Library Service Conference in Nashville. And we were very excited to be able to center there. And she also recently participated in the National Library Service's MOCA pilot project, where they're working on a new um, wireless box that they're hoping to evolve and change in the future, years down the line. And so she got a test box and tested it out on her own out in the house to see what the service was like, and played around with it and gave a lot of feedback back to the national level. Um, and on her own time, I'd like to commend Jackie for maintaining her teacher certification in both Oregon and Montana. Um, and she does her own professional development for that, and I think that's really impressive. So, yeah, thank you for coming here. Thank you. Thank you. What, what do you teach? Um, well, mainly library, library skills, but also Montana uh, history, history in general, government, and also elementary ed. So, Very cool. All over. Very cool. <laughs> We know that Jackie is much beloved by the patrons that she serves. Could I ask what the age of your patrons are? Uh, majority, I would say 70s, 80s, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so older clientele, but you know, we've had people as young as preschool age and four books of mm -hmm. early learning. And one patron's 103. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Jackie. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So next we're going to approve the minutes. Um, and we need is there any uh, discussion about the October 9 minutes or is there a motion to approve that? Move to approve. Second. Okay, thank you, Kenny. Um, I don't know who, maybe uh -huh. Elsie. <laughs> right. um, so if there isn't any discussion, um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those against say nay. Um, and any abstentions? The motion passes. Thank you. Um, 
And then just for your information, the final uh, minutes from August 8th. Uh, next, we're going to have Stacy Arstrom from the governor's legislative, um, the governor's office about governor's office legislative agenda come up. Thank you, Stacy. Do you want to have a seat by Marlos? Great. All right. Well, first off, um, my name is Stacy Otterstrom. I'm with Governor Steve Bullock's office. I'm his boards and appointments advisor. So most of you, we've had numerous email or phone call interactions. Um, let me just say it's great to see you in person. I don't always get to come to the commission meeting. So um, make sure that you know we really, really appreciate what you guys do. Uh, giving time out of your day, out of your work, um, and everything else to help the state of Montana and really bring your perspective to the work that's being done here at the State Library. So thank you. Um, as far as a legislative agenda for 2019, you've probably heard a lot of these things, but let me kind of run through the governor's top priorities. I'm not maybe the best expert at diving into the details of his budget. Again, not my area of expertise in the office, but I'll do my best. And if I can't answer a question, we'll make sure to get the information back to you. Um, Governor Bullock, as he heads into 2019, is primarily focused on a couple of things. Medicaid expansion for Montana, preschool for Montana, infrastructure, and doing all of that while maintaining an ending fund and balanced budget. Um, all of those things being said are going to take some negotiation. I don't think I have to tell you all that the last couple of legislative cycles and the budget uh, and fiscal situation that Montana finds itself in is going to be a major part of this upcoming session. So those are the things he, the, the big ticket items that he's really focused on trying to find some consensus moving forward. Um, beyond that, it's my understanding a lot of what you guys had are going are, were proposed through this budget at the same same level, so no increase, no decrease. But of course, we'll see what happens over the next four months. Yeah, I know that the governor had um, some preschool uh, legislation in previous session sessions. Is the intent to um, continue to grow the program that's been in place with the, the pilot communities. Yeah, so he's got, and again, I, I'm not going to know all the details, but my understanding of it with his budget proposal that he put out, uh, and, and the superintendent probably knows this even better than I do, the budget proposal has in it kind of twofold. It has an increase in the grant programs out to private and public providers who are providing preschool programs. And then it also offers, I believe, an opportunity for school districts to start providing the services. Um, that is what he has proposed. That is the bill that will be going in front of the legislature. Um, that's the one he's talking about right now. How, how does that uh, sort of uh, coordinate with the state library's early childhood uh, programs? It's a very good question. I don't know. I guess I'd be looking to you all to answer that one. Uh, in, in previous legislation, and we haven't seen this legislation, there hasn't been any uh, opportunities for funding. Where we primarily intersect is in providing resources, particularly to the providers in the communities, the, the public and private providers, who then make use of the early literacy resources available through their local libraries. Hmm. If it was successful, um, I can foresee that we would basically run out of capacity fairly quickly. Capacity. <laughs> of a rural, move to a rural, out of the capital city into the rural environment. No, I mean, seriously, I mean, it's, so it strikes me that, that we've been able to demonstrate with some of our early early learning kinds of things, uh, some, it's been very successful. I mean, mm -hmm. it's worked for the kids and for the, and for the parents. And uh, uh, it strikes me that there there's uh, that's sort of the informal side of the more formal sort of preschool thing, and it might be good to at least coordinate them programmatically. But I hadn't actually thought of the funding thing that it actually, if we actually did coordinate, that we'd be in trouble because we don't have the capacity to meet the to meet the kind of need that I'm sure is out there. And I have no idea how this coordinates with schools, with uh, yeah, Kate. 
K-12 stuff. The library part or mm -hmm. the, the, the library part or or the, the governor's proposed programs. It'd be nice to see at least some arrows of diamond with arrows and footnotes. <laughs> it's very early yet. I mean, I've, I've seen a glimmer of what the bill looks like. I've not seen the fiscal bill. I've heard some things, but I have not. I know the governor, I've had multiple conversations in his office as well as in mine. Chuck's, we were just at his son's um, middle school on Monday with uh, coding, an hour of code, which is an international celebration of problem solving with young students. So there's conversation that's there. I haven't seen a lot at this point. I would absolutely encourage the library and the commission to stay engaged through the legislative process on this one, um, making sure that that it addresses any concerns you might have. Obviously this is going to be a tight mm -hmm. budget year. Um, we've already, we know that, that that's going to be the case. So increased spending is probably a difficult thing at this point, but making sure that needs are met is going to be critical. And so figuring out if there are any creative ways and watching that process unfold will be important for you all. I know we're asking ourselves for a restoration of what was taken from session as well as special session action. That'd be so lovely. bringing it back up uh, schools, the first, um, the first point uh, what we triangulate with the governor's office and legislative fiscal as well as our fiscal people, it'll be about um, $70.6 million is what is owed to schools in current legislation. And it was uh, 22 million less last time. But because of action, things are being put back onto state responsibility rather than local is where things were transferred. Mm -hmm. um, state schools, and what we have with our heritage properties as well as within the land board, uh, I received a check uh, two weeks ago for 41 million. We are <laughs> we are down, well, so that 41 million will help uh, fund the 70.6 million that is requested at this point for just existing statute requirements. We are down 12 years, or 12 in 10 years, we're down 12 million dollars from our state lands. Mm. So in, in in real money. In real money. And that comes from commodities because we are heavy egg state, but there are other things besides commodities, things that are growing, you know, and I'm not giving a report here on land board, but things that are growing are in between a 93, our retail division, which is very young within the state lands purview. And uh, so it's commercial real estate that is growing more so. Timber is remaining <clears throat> constant, which is a positive, especially after we had a much uh, better fire season than last. Mm -hmm. So, but all of those things fill the bucket for schools first. And as you had said, a very tight fiscal, we monitor everything so we can give any opportunity to schools for students. What, what, what is the governor's office um, uh, uh, forecast for coal revenues? That is beyond my uh, understanding. I know, big picture, that natural resources are going down. That's part of why we're in the budget situation that we are and have been over the last you know decade. As you're seeing, natural resource income from natural resource uh, extraction in Montana decline. Our general fund is largely based on those types of taxes. I think that's why. Well, I don't think I know that is why Governor Bullock has been talking about. Um, smart, reasonable ways to transition our revenue in Montana from natural resources into more of the service sector and the tourism and the outdoor rec areas because that's our economy at this point. As Montana's economy is transitioning, our revenue sources are not. Um, that's going to be a big focus now and probably for the next decade in Montana is how do we acknowledge that because there will be a couple of options. Either we continue to keep our budgets matching those revenues that are decreasing, in which that means our programs will continue to decrease, or we find new ways to new sources of revenue. We're, we're libraries are dependent on coal severance tax funds, mm -hmm. and, and while revenues have been actually increasing for those, that seems to me possibly to me an anomaly. Mm -hmm. And so I'm concerned about that because without those funds, we would. Have to go rob banks. 
Yeah, it's just following. I mean, it's following. <laughs> it's just following the economy. Um, you know, where revenue comes for the state has to follow where where it's being spent, and so figuring out what that looks like as as our economy evolves and as it starts evolving more and more rapidly is going to be a challenge for a generation at least. They'll see just. <clears throat> Does recreation tourism play into state lands in the land board at all? Is there any commodity type uh, products? No, it does not. No, we are. It's pretty much quality with that little bit of that retail mm -hmm. part of it. We we make sure that subservice is available for the public Mm -hmm. I just wonder, like, you know, like uh, Mako, Daniels County was yes. this session on the other day by sort of a, the way they were formed 25% state lands, 25% of their all their lands, so they're really their tax base is much lower. It is very much in fact just with, with the school, but the county superintendent yeah. yesterday. With so much of the tourism um, and recreation being, at least a lot of the economic factors are hunting and fishing, and mm -hmm. certainly state lands are. A giant part of that. I mean, has that been part of the discussion at all? It has been, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with the delicate balance between federal and state and private is always a conversation at the state land board. I do enjoy being a participant of that. Uh, I've enriched you know, my knowledge of what we have in Montana and what our treasures can be, or and they all go to our schools, which is, of course, our number one treasure mm -hmm. for students. And it's, it's interesting that some of the most, I think, interesting uh, student projects, like with mapping the stuff we do, story maps, have been trail oriented, you know, local resources for recreation, and, and um, the kids do a great job with promoting that. So it'd be interesting to have more discussions on that later. Does anyone have any other questions for Stacey? Does it, one other question the infrastructure, um, I assume that's primarily. Water, sewer, roads. Does broadband play into that? Or? It does. Um, I don't know specifically how, but I remember them saying that broadband is part of that discussion. I don't know if that means funding or if that means private. I know there's a lot of private entities trying to help in that because obviously connecting Montanans too also helps in their in their um, assessments. But broadband is a big part of of infrastructure because it becomes part of the community and it's necessary to connect rural Montana up to it. So I know it's part of the discussions, I just don't know the specific dollar amounts mm -hmm. or, or any of those details for you. I can see what I can find yeah, and get it to you. That'd be great, Stacey, I appreciate that. Yeah. It'd be interesting too to pursue the, I know that the, like the 911 funds are dedicated to 911 and not, but there may be some indirect benefits there as they um, you know, a lot of the redundancy for, you know, for 911 centers where line gets cut and 911 is not reachable is pretty critical. And there's some big divides in Montana between the legacy mm -hmm. um, CenturyLink and I mean how that was split out and and just some of the fundamental, uh, you know, infrastructure at the telcos, telecommunications companies, mm -hmm. to facilitate that. There may be some indirect ways as they. As they try to make this more interoperable for 911, maybe there's a way that that helps everybody else too. I don't know. Because there's that $5 million fund that their, the legislature will be dealing with, right. or that the committee will be dealing with. Right. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for being here. We really yes. appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you again for everything, you guys. And I'll get you some more information. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. All right, next on the agenda, we have um, John Finn with the Montana Library Association Legislative Agenda. Stacey, I was going to tell you we have the updated handbook for the commission. Great. 
It's just one real quick thing, guys. You don't need to be sliding the mics around because they're really sensitive. They pick up a broad range. So while I appreciate you moving it for people, you don't need to. Morning. Um, Nanette's not able to make it today. Um, so uh, the Montana Library Association uh, Government Affairs Committee held a two-day retreat on November 8th and 9th, and it was very productive. And um, we came away with a legislative agenda and also uh, a stronger committee, um, I believe. We worked on communication, how we we're going to get the word out to librarians across the state, and um, uh, just a better idea of how Government Affairs Committee is going to work during the upcoming session and beyond. And so I just wanted to talk about the list of priorities that we came up with for the coming session. We have one main priority, and that is um, supporting funding for the State Library. Um, and then we have a list of other priorities that falls under a category of, if needed, the Montana Library Association will support or uh, work um, uh, to oppose uh, any of these following issues. And those issues are support, and these are not ranked in any order, support for state aid per capita for public libraries, support for school libraries and teacher librarians, intellectual freedom. This would most likely be opposition to a bill if there's any sort of uh, censoring bill that is uh, uh, proposed. Opposition to any bathroom bills, similar to the one proposed in 2017 session. Any pornography bills. Um, revenue enhancement, but only if it is a big picture uh, revenue enhancement bill, um, and specifically if it benefits libraries. Um, and then broadband, we would support if it benefited libraries in particular. Those are our priorities for this uh, legislative session. We did come up with a list of priorities for future sessions. I don't know if we want to talk about those. Um, funding for libraries, uh, which is broad at this point. We haven't really uh, worked on what that might be, but we are sessions out. Um, but that would include funding for E-rate, funding for Montana Library to go, funding for statewide databases, and other resource sharing items. Uh, funding for federations. Uh, possible update to Library Records Confidentiality Act and other library laws, protection against record destruction, open education resources, or OER. Um, the association is going to try to pass a resolution uh, this year uh, at the uh, conference here in Helena in 2019. LSTA, nationwide effort to increase funding for grants to states. Uh, we'll try to pass a resolution this year as well. Analysis of coal tax, what will the future bring? Are we prepared for what happens? Local government issues, including funds for buyouts and wage issues, workforce training and collaboration, the return of the Library Services and Construction Act funds, uh, possible work with other groups on economic development, social services, mental health, um, homelessness, prison reentry, early childhood education, ACEs. That's what we're working on for the coming sessions, or at least are going to be on our radar. I have a question, if I may. Yes. It, it sounds like a wonderful weekend. It sounds like a really uh, would love to do a fly on the wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, was the tenure of your discussions help to libraries, um, individual libraries, or what, was there? Was there a consideration of sort of um, moving towards uh, increasingly cooperative uh, uh, programs to be funded and supported, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? I, I would say both, actually. We, we talked a lot about um, cooperative services that the state library offers and things that are happening throughout the state on a cooperative basis. But also, I mean, we're we're trying to help our own individual libraries, but to do that, it's often through cooperation. So we talked about both. Is it your sense that the state library continuing down that cooperative road is a is a, a, a reasonable path to take? I think it's a necessity. Yeah. I think everybody at that meeting feels that it's the state library that really drives what public libraries do in the state. 
awesome responsibility. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what it's always been. That's where we look. That sounds great. Does anyone have any other questions for John? Just one other one, John. Would there be any partnerships throughout this legislative process where libraries are going to be joining other if, organizations? Absolutely. Other we we talked about that over the retreat as well, and uh, we would love to identify partners um, if if it benefited libraries. And, but it, that has to be a priority. That um, if we see. Uh, the benefit to public libraries or libraries of all types in the state, we would most definitely mm -hmm. consider it. Well, thank you, John. Thanks. You do such a good job with the uh, Library Association Government Affairs. It's really great. Thanks. And you keep us all informed. So, you know, that's it's a really big thing to, to make sure everyone knows what's going on. We appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Okay, next up, we have the Montana State Library Legislative Update. Um, I just, well, a, a few things. I didn't I didn't necessarily put time on the agenda for Elsie or Kenny, but if, if you had any updates that you wanted to talk about from your legislative priorities, I think we'd be interested in hearing them. Well, we don't get to lobby directly. Mm -hmm. that, that goes to, um, the official lobbyist for Montana State University. I'm assuming this is true for you, Lynn. That is true. Um, John mentioned OER, um, which which you're involved with and uh, heavily, and uh, I'm on the, the Trails OER committee. And um, we met, and there, there's going to be a training in Bozeman February 1st for the Open Textbook Network. And so I did ask if it's appropriate to include the State Library, mm -hmm. and they would very much like you to come to that mm -hmm. if you're able to or to send someone right um, because they would like the state library definitely to be looped into that plus you're you have a seat on trails right so it's appropriate for for you to do that so that will be in bozeman on um, february 1st and it's a full day of training the open textbook network um, they will send some trainers from i don't know where their headquarters are minneapolis minneapolis yeah. okay University yeah. of and that's capped at 75 so as soon as yeah. that um, registration comes out i can send that to you and i know that was a future legislative <laughs> agenda but it's you know one that you want to get in the ground ground I'm sure it's february 1st i mean the date i heard yesterday was january 31. well um yeah they said they told me february 1st we I had gone back and forth, um, and there was some, so I'll double check that, but there was some reason, something going on at Missoula on the 31st where that um, contingency couldn't come. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Elsie, I didn't know if you wanted I, to add I do. Um, just quickly not to take into this. Uh, um, this would be my second session in this role. My first one was all about budget. So number one, it is about restoring the budget and I shared that about how much money that is going on in the schools but I do have four that are legislative priorities at this point two are dealing with school safety at the very top of the priority the first one we call the student safety accountability act it has two parts in it one of them is a federal requirement that we cannot have individuals within any kind of a school environment from a bus driver to any aid of any kind because we only hold professional licenses to aid or abet anybody who has sexual misconduct with a student. The second part of that is saying that if there is any of that uh, sexual misconduct to a student, that um, what is the definition of a student right now are sexual consent laws is age of 16. And um, we are saying that school is a safe harbor. We have students up to the age of 21 in our schools. So there's it's going to be in Chapter 45 or Title 45. We only deal in 20 in school law. So we've had the AG's office help us with that. And we do have um, the placeholders are in, the LCs are in for all of these proposals. So the first one is the Student Safety Accountability Act with those two parts. The second one is school safety as we know as teachers. That's a different way of learning. It's a different manner of professional development. So we are um, offering 
a million dollars over the biennium in a grant program. My first initial thought was, let's just do another PIR day. But a PIR day at 3.4 million coming from state support increases local taxes. Mm -hmm. And it increases um, all kinds of things within the formula. It's a very delicate formula. So rather than doing that, we are using a million dollars that comes in from our, our two budgets of OPI. <clears throat> when we have the Senate uh, nine rollbacks, uh, we uh, are incorporating a million of that. It was a 1.1 that came back to us. So we're going to be using a million of that going back out into schools and distribution to schools. And um, we're very excited that you've talked to that mm -hmm. teachers. Can look at any manner, shape, or form. We're currently in the process through accreditation saying that from a 2013 law, a school district had to have a school safety plan. It's not up to the state to say what's in that plan or what the plan looks like or what it should be or could be, but um, this will help some schools do that. It is part of the biennium. Then our third one is a partnership with the university system in saying that student data um, is precious, but there are some student data components that should be transferred. And this is our statewide uh, assessment for the ACT. And in the partnership that um, I have built with um, OCHI and the university system, making sure that that information is transferred so that students that do not even think that they might be able to go to college and have that be in their pathway, we can use this data together to um, enrich a, a, a pathway for a student that may not even think that college is on their horizon. And that uh, has absolutely no monies to it at all. The Student Safety Accountability Act has no monies at this point either. The uh, professional development that I talked about are, is original monies that we have that we're just moving from one part of a budget to another. And our last one um, has no monies either. But because of the challenges of all of the $2 billion that flow into Montana schools, there is a payment schedule that is scripted in law. And our largest payments uh, amount over $200 million in May and in November. So we, all, we know in November, Property taxes is what fills the treasury bucket at this time. And then we know that income tax receipts fill it up in May. But the amount of money that goes out right now in November is not sufficient with what we have in treasury. So basically, we're just flip-flopping November and December so that we would have an ability to have the treasury filled up for a promise to monies to go to schools. I know in the time that I have spent here, we have been asked by the budget office to um, withhold payments, to change payments, and that I have a promise kept to schools. This will help that promise. And if you'll re recall when the special session happened, it was in November. And one of the reasons was stated was because there was money that needed to go to schools that the Treasury did not have. So hopefully that will heal that. It doesn't give more money to schools. It gives that to just in one month flip flop. And, um, we're just trying to fix the process, knowing what comes in and what flows out. But we also know what's a promise to schools needs to be held because a promise is a promise. Thank you for letting me take the time. Thanks, Elsie. Appreciate it. Can I just add a little bit more to the sure. OER conversation? Please. I didn't realize we were going to talk about this because it's not directly legislated. Um, but I just want to remind everyone that the, the OER program is funded by OCHI. And so the membership in the Open Textbook Network, which is um, based at the University of Minnesota, was funded by OCHI. And so that's where the training is coming from. There will be a second training, I understand, later in the year. Um, after a little bit of uh, back and forth, OCHI did agree that this should be open to um, uh, all the, all the um, colleges in the, in the state, and not just the NBMS. Um, and the other thing is they are also funding a position and an OER coordinator. And we posted that position in September or October and the it, uh, reviews of the applications are starting now. So we hope to have somebody in place by February. Great. Great. Thanks, Kenny. 
so just some updates by way of the state library. The, you know, the governor's uh, budget did come out in November. It's largely what we anticipated. Uh, it includes the statewide present law adjustment funding of about uh, $450,000 that would allow us to restore much of the FTE that we lost. It didn't really include much in the way of any restoration of our operational budgets. It includes funding for just general fixed cost and inflation deflation adjustments. Uh, those are relatively minor. Um, there are a, a couple of uh, negative decision packages. The one that we've talked about would remove from the books one FTE and in discussions with the budget office, we concluded that that would be two part-time positions that total the one FTE that were associated with the closure of the reading room. Um, and again, that's a, a good faith effort to show that we are trying to hold our FTE uh, and hopefully bolster the argument that the remaining FTE that are on the books, we should be allowed to fill and have, have the funding restored. Um, there are uh, other uh, negative decision packages reflect reductions in authority to the Emily Act grant program and, and reduction in authority to spend the LSTA grant funds. That's just bringing that uh, funding authority into alignment with the actual cash that we spend. So it's not a, a reduction in budget. It won't have any kind of impact on our ability to spend the funds on the services that we offer. It's just a reflection of a reduction in authority. Um, this could potentially be a benefit to us as we make our way through the legislative process because uh, historically we've seen, for example, the legislature create uh, caps on the percentage increase in agency budgets. And so by giving up some budget authority, it could offset the increase uh, that we would see in the statewide present law adjustment for the FTE um, and, and to bring those percentages into alignment. Uh, in the legislative analysis that's going to come out here in a couple weeks, when they look at what our, our base budget was from the last biennium to what's proposed in the executive budget, it's about a 4.6% increase. So that's a number that the legislature will pay attention to. And so by having these, um, these decreases in authority to offset some of the increases, that helps keep that in balance. So uh, we can talk about that a little bit more uh, in our work session if you have more questions. Uh, the budget itself is in your packet, and I included some descriptions about what those decision packages are that you'll see. Those will be going to the subcommittee. Um, the governor's budget does include some revenue enhancements, largely looking at increases to cigarette and alcohol taxes, uh, as well as funding for expanded Medicaid and some of the priorities you heard Stacy talk about. Uh, and as Stacy said, there'll be some give and take in that process. Uh, in listening to the Revenue and Transportation Interim Committee, where they adopted uh, revenue estimates for the legislature and then the Legislative Finance Committee on Monday, uh, the legislature and the executive are very close in their revenue projections. Where they differ is on corporate taxes and basically uh, they're about $40 million apart. So what the Revenue and Transportation Inter Committee uh, proposed and was adopted was uh, an amount that kind of split that difference. So their, their difference is about $23 million, which in a, a you know $2.2 billion budget is pretty minuscule. Uh, and I think the, the tenor of conversations around revenue uh, have been um, that largely they're on the same page. So that's encouraging as we go into the legislative session. Um, it will be around some of these different kinds of legislative priorities and where they impact the budget. Um, the chief legislative uh, Chief of the Legislative Fiscal Division said, you know, from her view, there's no need to cut the budget further. She went on record saying that. Um, but again, it'll it'll come down to different kinds of priorities. Uh, we had a meeting with our legislative analyst at the end of last week, just clarifying things for the budget analysis that will come out from the Legislative Fiscal Division ahead of the session. And um, she is not hearing um, 
news at this point in time about any kind of global motions to eliminate FTE. What she is hearing is that those kinds of decisions will be left up to the individual subcommittees to make. And so I think I think that's encouraging. And I think um, it's encouraging that we're uh, hearing that much of the cuts that were taken, the legislature intends to see restored. So again, I think that's that's cause for optimism. It certainly doesn't mean we don't need to let our guard down or, or not do the, the important work ahead of the session to uh, make sure that people understand our concerns and our priorities. Uh, but uh, you know, I continue to be optimistic about the things that I'm hearing coming out of the legislature and of other agencies. May I ask a, yes. two questions? One's a stupid question, I'll ask a second. <laughs> the, the first one is we're, we're talking about reducing our LSTA uh, uh, budget authority. Mm -hmm. And what was our authority previous? Um, I, I'd have to go back and look at the float up in just a second. Um, but, but we're, we're cutting um, the proposal removes about 350000 in um, okay. An authority that is typically reverted. That's okay. And, and so, mm -hmm. so that's the mechanism. So instead mm -hmm. of reverting, what we're trying to do is have the authority more closely match. match. We want it to match. But, would and we have was, to do this every biennium then to no, take an adjust? No, this is this will be a one-time um, adjustment that will correct it going forward. So if if we were successful, um, we state libraries around the nation were successful in upping the amount of Ellis. TA, we would have to go back in and fiddle with this again to we would increase have to, our authority? We would have to make sure we had the budget authority to spend. In, in, in process, that's not a problem? Typically not. That especially would be a problem because we can ask for more authority in the interim. We don't have to wait for a session. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay. The, the second question is really stupid, but I, I don't understand the language about statewide present law. What, what is statewide present law? That's just the current budget? Um, it, okay. <laughs> it, so uh, I'll look to, to Melissa to help me out, but but these are uh, um, adjustments that are, that are required by law. So we have, for example, all of the employees of state government, and we have what it costs to, to pay all of our salaries and benefits this uh, biennium, and there'll be an increase to what it costs. So this is sort of the baked-in cost for things as they are now, right. baked in by present law. Yep. How did I do? I think that's perfect. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I just, I, and, I've heard you use that thing, and I've never yeah. really known what it meant. And and there there is disagreement, and it was talked about in the LFC meeting on Monday about whether or not, for example, the restoration of funding for personal services should be considered present law, or whether or not it should actually be considered a new proposal. Um, ah. So that that's a that's a point of of. Disagreement may, might be too strong a word, but at least it's a point of difference that was identified in the LFC meeting. But um, I think to our way of thinking and the executive's way of thinking, um, again, we have FTE on the books. So it's, They are so not it's, new FTE. So present, present law uh, adjustment means here's our budget and this is, this is what's on the books in terms of law. This is what our budget looks like after it's been acted upon mm -hmm. by those requirements. Let me, let me just say it a little bit differently. Okay, so great, state, great. Statewide present law is capturing um, the existing, what the cost will be in the next biennium for the existing base budget. And so there are things that increase, like people get longevity increases that have been here. That yes. Are, like Jackie just did. Because it's so, inflation as well. Um, inflation is statewide present law package two. Um, so statewide package, the, the first package has to do with personal services costs, the second is inflation mitigation. And so our, the snapshot on the library, is it being negatively impacted by having those um, positions unfilled? Um, right, uh, well, yes, yeah, yes in some ways. Um, so when the snapshot is taken for a position and it's vacant, what is funded is uh, the, the position is funded at entry, which is 80% of market. So, um, you know, were we successful in 
keeping the FTE and having the funding, we would essentially be only, we would only be funded to fill those positions at a salary of 80% of, of market. Um, the reality is, of course, that we didn't have the funding to fill those positions before the snapshot, so there was really nothing that we could do about that. Um, but, but yes, so so that's a negative of not having them filled. I still look at it as a positive in that we would have positions that we could they fill. The books, yeah. They are on the books, and we could fill, uh, you know, as many as them as possible through this process. So, Jenny, do you have a cadre of champions? I know, and it's probably done that over her course of time. We we do, um, and a, you know, a couple of them are on our budget subcommittee. Senate, Senator Hamlet and um, Representative Woods are strong supporters. Um, Senator Sasso has always been a strong supporter. Um, we will talk about that a little bit more in our work session. Um, we have some new. You've probably looked at the committee makeup um, for the education subcommittee. There's some new legislators there that I don't know. I'm curious if you know or have worked with some of the new senators in particular. Any other questions about where we sit from a budget perspective? Well, one other bit of good news that I just heard on the news was that the this last fire season was the lowest in a long time, so we, we don't have that. But was it 70 million additional mm -hmm. stress on the budget mm -hmm. from the previous fire season? I think there'll be some discussion in the session. You know, we have the new budget stabilization reserve fund, yes, RF, is that what the acronym is? Um, which has a, 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 in legislation, what funding flows into it uh, when there's a surplus. Um, there's discussion about how much balance they want to see in the fire fund as well. So um, I think we'll see some discussion remaining about how much surplus we should have and, and what goes into the rainy day fund and the fire fund. Just one sort of somewhat frivolous general comment, but um, as we all prepare for the our roles in the session, um, I just happened to re-listen to um, Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence mm -hmm. People, and uh, published in 1936. It's an amazing Book. It's so timeless and and, and particularly uh, relevant in this day and age. I think <laughs> yeah. it's a good read or listen. Um, from a legislative perspective, again, we're not carrying any any legislation. Um, there are 2,212 LCs out there right now. I've looked through about 700 of them so far, so I've got some catch up to do. Um, there are a couple of bills out there to generally revise library laws, generally revise library funding, uh, one from Representative Wood, one from Senator Pomnichowski. I've talked to both of those legislators and, and we've seen this in past legislative sessions. Those are out there as placeholders should the need for any kind of legislation arise. Um, so uh, we don't anticipate anything coming out of those pieces of legislation. There's lots out there to do with generally revising local governments, generally revising special district laws, uh, lots to do with um, state government. We'll be watching, of course, any kind of pay plan bills, any bills that impact uh, employee pensions and other kinds of uh, generally general state government laws. Any um, laws about levies? Um, I'm sure that there are some about, out there about levies. So there's not a lot of actual text out there right now, so we'll start to see more and more of the actual bill drafts coming forward right now. What we're seeing are a lot of bill draft titles and um, creating our watch lists, lists so that we can continue to watch them. As John said, we're taking a wait and see approach with the state aid per capita legislation. Um, we continue to think that it's wise to not draw attention to that piece of legislation and the appropriation that will resume if nothing happens to that legislation. So we're, we're not going to raise attention to it. Um, we do know that there'll be further revision to the next generation 911 laws, largely to extend the deadlines for some of the work that still needs to be accomplished to create a statewide 911 plan. 
uh, our work to complete the GIS assessment will be done this biennium, so we do not need to extend those deadlines. Uh, there was the temporary account for funding to do the GIS assessment. That account is intended to go off the books once the work is done. My understanding, and I haven't seen the legislation yet, is that the revisions will keep that account in existence, but there won't be any funding in it. However, it would mean that the, the mechanism to move uh, any kind of future funds into an account would continue to exist for any kind of GIS work. So again, I haven't seen that legislation yet, so that's something that we'll be looking at. Um, so lots out there to, to watch for. I, th I think last session, I stopped monitoring bill drafts when there are around 2,300 and there are almost that many at this point, this session, and we have a long ways to go. I heard federally from uh, an individual who does all of this tracking in all of our states, and this is going to be a record year <laughs> for multiple uh, wanting to augment current statutes across our nation. Yeah. And then finally, we, we continue to hear that our budget hearing will be February 5th uh, from our legislative analyst. I know that um, our committee chair, Lou Jones, was going to review that calendar with our legislative analyst this week. So um, I, that could still move, but right now that that's still what's on the calendar. And library legislative night then is also scheduled for February 5th. Would that stay the same if it... It will stay the same regardless of whether the budget hearing moves. That's something we have to get on the calendar very early. Questions, comments, discussion, staff, did I leave out anything? What, this is, I guess, more a question for John. What, what role does the, I mean, because the library association has a lobbyist, what can individual libraries do or what's their, what's the rules of, interaction with legislators? Individual libraries uh, roles would be to stay in touch with their, their legislators and introduce themselves if they're new legislators um, and uh, just make sure that they're aware of library issues. And if something comes up, uh, they will be educated on um, what the association is feeling and they can uh, talk to their legislators about those issues. We, we have a new communication, line of communication set up that uh, was announced to uh, MLA membership last week that um, is getting uh, good results already. I mean, folks have uh, complimented us on coming up with the, uh, the way to communicate. And I think it's gonna be a good session. I really, really wanna commend MLA and John for this government affairs committee. We have representation um, that has expertise in local government law, state government law, um, library education, uh, the university system, um, obviously public library representation. We have some subcommittees that are focused on communication with legislators, communication from the committee to the MLA membership. There's another group that's thinking more deliberately about how we organize our approach to legislation and the resolution setting process. Um, and then our staff have put together a really helpful map tool that helps identify legislators and their librarians to help uh, the ease the communication process uh, where you can search by library and find the legislators, by legislators or legislative districts and find the libraries. Um, so it'll be a really, really useful tool. And so I, I'm really excited about the progress that's been made. Before we go on to your report, um, I would request we take a five minute break. Great. Right. And come back uh -huh. at about 1040. Go, go find another panel. Thank you. I don't actually have anything to write on, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not sure. If we want coffee, we should go upstairs, shouldn't we? Mm -hmm. What about beer? <laughs> <laughs> you, you go home. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the Roth gallery. Like, I'm done. I'm going for my beer. <laughs>
I think we can get started. Okay. All right. Well, first, you had asked about uh, coal severance tax revenue, mm -hmm. and Melissa has been in conversation with the budget office about their revenue projections. Uh, and um, based on what they told her, uh, you know, we have the increasing amount of authority. So we have just shy of $500,000 in coal severance tax authority this year. And it looks like uh, revenue projections are strong and that we should have the amount of cash we need. Melissa, well, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add about your conversations with them. No, I think that um, so far it looks like we're on track to get what they projected for this year. Um, and they have not updated their projections yet in the governor's budget for coal for next year in our budget. So we'll wait to see what the projections are. But I don't anticipate um, they're not making enough cash for our applications. So why, why are projections up? That does seem anomalous. Mm -hmm. as we said earlier. Um, some of it has to do with the um, the cost the value of coal, um, so I don't I don't think that um, production has declined all that much, but the the cost of coal what they're getting for the coal is up, which is yielding greater. Well, that seems odd too that the cost would have gone up, or the, or the value of it. I think there's a from something that I read, there, it's um, more more dependent on an international, <laughs> international market, which may have changed yeah. price points. Mm -hmm. But we're that, surrounded by coal companies right? going bankrupt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. I don't think mm -hmm. that means you're going out of production. I just think the companies mm -hmm. are going bankrupt. Mm -hmm. But they're still right. That's confusing. So it's a, I don't understand. Does anyone mm -hmm. understand coal? <laughs> Did we? I don't know if there's a, an economist in the budget office that we could bring in that could there talk is. about this. Absolutely, Rob would love to come. Good. Oh, that'd be, oh yeah, that'd be a cool that would thing. be great. Let's, uh, we'll make a note to invite Ralph to your February meeting. To sort, sort of the Mac, uh, kind of a global, then mm -hmm. sort of United States, and then sort of a regional, and then what it means for our stuff. That's still how it all. Okay. What's the big picture, and then how does it all fit? That'd be great. I, I continue to think that, that, that it, it, it must inevitably at some point begin to decline mm -hmm. or <laughs> become tropical in Montana. And, and, and at some point, we probably should be thinking strategically about um, how much money we'd really be getting of that sort of money if we were getting as much as we needed. You've mm -hmm. heard this before, mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and what, what would we do to replace the, the CST stuff? Mm -hmm. um, uh, as that inevitable decline hits us, and, and um, I would never suggest that we would we would trade off uh, existing funds for uh, you know, bird in the hand, uh, but uh, I think we should be thinking about this. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so just to further the conversation a little bit about the coal severance tax account, uh, we as I said we do have the increased authority. We have right now about 167,000 uh, if production is holding the cash is there to spend out in our authority. We do want to, we've, we've talked about making sure that we have some cash carry over in the account, um, but we don't want to leave authority on the table. We, we want to make sure we're spending that authority and, and um, ensuring that we're demonstrating that the, the funding is necessary. So. Um, our staff is going to be meeting next week to talk about how we might spend this additional money that's not currently budgeted for programs. Of course, we've, we've spent, we've paid the um, Library Federations 176000 We also have about just shy of 100000 of that that goes to pay for our contracts with OCLC and Circe Dynex. So that's been paid. Some of it goes to pay for uh, our state publications digitization contract and some of the other um, databases that we license for state employees and our professional development collection with OverDrive. So um, those things are budgeted, um, but we have some additional money that we need to spend. Um, you know, we're cognizant of a number of things as we think about how to spend this money, the volatility that we've seen and not using it to fund things that uh, might require ongoing funding. Uh, we 
are also at this point really feeling the pinch of the loss of staff um, because we can come up with any number of really, really great ideas and not have the staff capacity to move forward with a lot of them. So that's really, we're really beginning to feel the burden of, of that issue. Um, but staff have a, a fairly lengthy list of ideas of things that we, we would like to pursue. It's a matter of ensuring that we have the capacity to do them and um, thinking through the, the value of the opportunities that are before us and our ability to, to support them. So we'll be bringing, I'm sure, those ideas to you in subsequent meetings. We talked a little bit about the Government Affairs Committee. John, in his report, mentioned the effort, the federal effort to increase funding for the Grants to States program through the Institute of Museum and Library Services and Library Services Technology Act. A couple of updates there. I think I've talked about this initiative from COSLA in the past. It actually started with the Western Council of State Libraries, and now COSLA is on the cusp of passing a resolution also in support of what we're calling a dollar per capita initiative, essentially um, asking the federal government to fund the grants per states program at roughly a dollar per capita or 325 million, roughly double the amount of funding that's there. Uh, right now, 10 other state library associations have passed resolutions in support of this effort. COSLA is going to appear before the American Library Association's Committee on Legislation to talk about this effort. It's through that committee that we hope to get support from ALA's Washington office. Uh, for as long as I can remember, ALA's position with regard to LSTA funds has always been to ask for level funding. They've not supported and asked for increased funds as long as I've been state librarian and I'm sure many years prior to that. So uh, asking for double the funding to grants to states is a fairly significant departure from their position, uh, but it's one that we're encouraging them to think very seriously about and we hope that having state associations support resolutions and working through the Committee on Legislation, uh, we hope that we can begin to sway them and then begin to champion that effort um, through Congress. Uh, we did hear that just yesterday the Senate passed legislation to reauthorize uh, the library, the Museums and Library Services Act, M MLSA. Uh, which is the authorizing legislation for IMLS. It had expired uh, a number of Congresses ago, so this is it's not a situation where they have it has to um, be authorized in order to receive funding. However, having the program authorized in legislation uh, helps to ensure that, that there is ongoing funding. Again, it's passed the Senate, and so it's moving on to the House. Uh, I, I, we're hearing that there's good momentum to hopefully get it reauthorized this Congress before the end of the calendar year. Uh, and then importantly in this reauthorization language uh, is a change to the base allotment that all states receive uh, through the Grants to States program. Right now that base allotment is 680,000 and this would increase the base to a million dollars per state and then the, the remaining balance is distributed based on a per capita formula. Uh, the authorization itself doesn't carry any funding, and so there would have to be an increase to the appropriation before that base allotment would take effect. But again, it creates the legislative authorization to do so. Uh, and by initial calculations, if uh, that uh, program is funded as, as necessary to fulfill the allotment, our funding would increase by about $300,000 or about 30%. So it's fairly significant for us. Um, so these are sort of two efforts that are going on at the same time. The reauthorization that will take, we hope will take place and that would include this allotment. It wouldn't necessarily increase our funding, um, but could set the stage for future increases to the grants to states and then this dollar per capita initiative that um, COSLA and other states are carrying forward. I did include a link to a story map that I created for COSLA that will document and track which states have adopted 
resolutions in support of this effort. It's in your, your commission packet. That's going to form kind of the, the front end website for causeless efforts to move this initiative forward. Jenny, the $300,000, that would be from the COSLA initiative, not from an increase in enlisted staff. Um, it, it would not be from the COSLA initiative. It's, it, if, um, if in the future, and there's, there's no funding effort out there right now dedicated to funding the increased base allotment, but in the future, if Congress, when they're creating a new budget for LSTA, looks at that authorization and says, you know, at a minimum, in order to give all states a million dollar base and ensure that no other state sees a decrease in their funding, we need to fund it at this level. That's really what the authorization does. Okay. Thank you. So sort of two separate efforts that kind of running in parallel. Okay. Any other questions there? So, um, with the increase in LST, um, the level funding is to that increase, correct? Or level level funding would not fund the increase. Oh, I mean um, the past increase because there was a slight increase in LST the last time um, it was passed, um, giving us a little more mm -hmm. funds. Yep. Um, so stable funding is based on that increase, right? Not yeah. Yeah, good question. Yes, not you're exactly right. back before You're exactly that. right. Yes. Yeah, good question. We have not yet received our FY19 award, although it's been uh, funded in the budget that Congress passed, as you know. So you know, really any time we should receive what that award amount will be for the, the current federal fiscal year. And then I also want to let you know that ALA is changing National Library Legislative Day very significantly this coming year. Um, when we talked about your travel priorities, we talked about making National Library Legislative Day one of your top travel priorities and sending a commissioner. Um, ALA is not having any kind of coordinated legislative day. Initially, we, we had been told that it was going to be held in conjunction with uh, the annual conference, which is in D.C. in June, that's something they've done before, and so we had anticipated that um, they would still hold their briefing day and have their Hill Day, but that it would be in June rather than in May. Um, they are not going to do that now. They're not going to hold any kind of national briefing day or national Hill Day. Instead, they are going to target select states and select Congress people and invite specific states in for some kind of Hill event in either February or March. We don't know what states, we don't know exact dates. Um, so they're changing course rather significantly. Uh, we have not heard why. I do know that they, you know, they have a new executive director of their ALA Washington office, um, and under her leadership, they are taking a much more targeted approach to what their legislative priorities will be. So we can only assume that the, they're taking a more targeted approach to their work with Congress as well. So uh, in talking to other colleagues from other states, Different states are taking different approaches. Um, a lot of states are still talking about sending a contingent to Washington in June uh, around ALA and then setting up their own congressional visits, which is something that we largely do anyway. You know, we Marlis works with all of the congressional offices to set up those visits to get them scheduled. Um, so we can absolutely continue with that plan if, if that's your will. It's what I would encourage. Um, we would have that then around ALA, so a, a commissioner, more than one commissioner, if we can afford to send commissioners would attend ALA as well, if that's something that's of interest to you. Um, we would have the Hill visits. What we would not have is that briefing day from ALA about ALA's legislative priorities. So that's something to, to think a little bit about. We could talk about it more when we get to your, your calendar as well. How many, um, would there be any value in, in some sort of an organized 
commissioner visit to uh, regional uh, Senate and Congress, you know, offices throughout Montana. Uh, organized meeting, you guys would go together? Or, I'm not sure or, what that would look like. But I, I wonder, I wonder how much stuff trickles up from the from the from the, the various. Most they have what half a dozen offices mm -hmm. throughout the state, maybe more. Mm -hmm. I wonder, and, and I, you know, and we've always, of course, encouraging the local libraries to go. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if there would be value in having sort of a MSL commissioner with some sort of a program that would, mm -hmm. would do it that way, and and also mm -hmm. the DC thing. Mm -hmm. But I wonder if, if that would be worth thinking about since we're mm -hmm. thinking since we're starting fresh. Sure, instead. absolutely. Yep. So basically, uh, what is the, the, the senator or the uh, representative would hear from their offices that, oh my God, there's librarians everywhere. Mm -hmm. And these are the things they're concerned about. I wonder if that would be a useful thing. Mm -hmm. I, I think it would. And, and there are librarians <laughs> and trustees out there who are already doing that, who are already visiting their offices. Um, but I don't think that it has occurred to them or that we have made that reached out to say that we would right. like to we would like to be a part of that. I mean, it was so much and fun in DC. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And I think there's um you know a lot of value to the local librarians going in and talking about local issues, but to have more of a, a representative contingency. So it's happening locally these are the these are the issues that we're concerned on the statewide basis. Mm -hmm. so, right. And, and then it's very targeted to what's on their mind for that for, for that particular district. But there's also they also would see then that there's state support behind what that that local contingency is trying to accomplish. Um, so maybe we could work on um, just getting invitations, putting ourselves out there to say that we would love to come when you're scheduling your meetings, and we could also I take initiative. That might cost some money for some travel, sure. some travel yeah. funds, yeah. but probably not huge amounts. Right, absolutely. The other thing that I'm thinking about is that you know, with NISJIC not having their their midwinter around um, at Annapolis with some some changes there. Um, NISJIC doesn't have as much opportunity for those kinds of hill, hill visits anymore either. And so it might create an opportunity for the commission to have a more coordinated approach to um, both some of the, the library legislation as well as the GIS legislation if we took that approach. What's NISJIC? The National States Geographic Information Council. Yeah, we GIS nerds. They had, for, for many years, they had their mid-year meeting in, um, in Annapolis, in part to allow for some engagement uh, with the individual states representatives. And we actually, I thought we did a good job of developing a good relationship. Mm -hmm. with it. It's been about three years now. Yes. Yeah. So we started taking that meeting elsewhere. It was also nice because it was uh, usually late February. So we got to go in there a couple months before um, the library legislative day. I think it helped. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. Right. Feedback off of Ken's discussion with Anne, if you had an issue toolkit that was accessible, any patron, mm -hmm. anyone could, you know, be an yeah. emissary of sharing the information and it could be all very simple. Right, exactly. They could do. They could do. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We you know, we always we always prepare those kinds of issue briefs ahead of mm -hmm. uh, our visits to the Hill, and so mm -hmm. we could absolutely share them and make them available. And that way you could get our regional congressional right. much. Right. One of the things that we had talked about doing for National Library Legislative Day is to try to do, um, create opportunities in state for librarians to better participate with those. ALA had done a better job of live streaming those briefing mm -hmm. days, and so we had talked about having some places where librarians could gather to uh, watch and participate and discuss what they were hearing. So I'm disappointed that that, that won't happen, uh, but maybe there's a way that we can kind of coordinate some of that in state. John's left, but you know, that might be a great uh, continued discussion or just communication tool for the Government Affairs Committee to talk more about as well. Well, there's the notion of doing it sort of locally, you know, here in Montana, having a follow-up in D.C. and sort of underlining mm -hmm. the, the, our, our, our reliance upon federal support for 
lot of the stuff we do. Yeah. It'd be I think maybe a, a good thing to do. Probably have to do it for a while before it took effect, but it seems like it's a, at least it's a, trying to address the right questions. And MLA doesn't do anything that for um, before library legislative night, do they? We, or traditionally, they we they have them. done an advocacy day. I don't know what the plans are. Mm -hmm. this year, but mm -hmm. In the past, they have. Yeah, and, and I know they're inviting librarians to come in for the day, go up to our capital, um, and then I don't know that we have the details ironed out, but we're talking about having a, an advocacy training for librarians that are participating okay. as well. Yeah. It's sort of the same format as mm -hmm. the, the National Day where you sort of have your briefing and some advocacy training and then you go yeah. visit with your local legislature and then yeah. the human. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But they might be reorganizing too. Mm -hmm. So when we get to your calendar, and if we need to talk about this again in February, that's fine. Um, I would like to, to talk about whether or not you guys still want to send a commissioner to ALA in June, and if, if we want to then organize it, some hell visits around that event. Um, so uh, we have a little bit of time to talk about that. Uh, and I have not talked to John about what MLA plans to do. MLA typically always sends um, John is the government affairs person, the president of MLA. They've talked about maybe um, sending someone else that might be able to speak about a particular issue, something like that. So with these changes, I'm not sure what their plans are. Um, and just moving on to kind of quickly wrap up here. Uh, I hope you're seeing lots of great uh, social media content around the public awareness campaign. Uh, the videos are out there. Um, we've seen newsletters. I was really glad to see Ann Eubanks letter to the editor. Uh, so there's lots of great publicity um, kind of gathering momentum from the public awareness campaign. I've heard from people in Lewistown saying I've, I've seen the stickers on cars. I heard from somebody here in Helena saying that they're seeing the stickers around. Uh, in the next couple of months, we'll start getting reports back from Bannock about uh, the actual reach of campaign. Uh, they have a number of metrics that they intend to report on back to us to, to help us better understand the, the impact of the campaign that we're seeing. Uh, and then I'll make sure and send the link out to all of you. There is a landing page for the campaign that the MLA is hosting that has all of the actual content for the campaign. So all of the artwork, uh, a wide variety of different kinds of talking points, uh, sample letters to the editor templates, newsletters, that kind of thing. Um, so I would encourage you as commissioners to take a look at the resources that are out there and available. And um, if you're interested in writing a letter to the editor or, or taking some action on your own, those resources are out there to support you. And then just finally, uh, an update on where we are with the Trust for Montana Libraries. We have five and possibly six board members that are committed. And so we have the needed number of board members to actually form our nonprofit. Uh, and so working with Stu Wilson, we're going to be scheduling a meeting of that board in January so that they can go through all of the appropriate filing documents, the bylaws, the Articles of Incorporation, the 501c3 filing, and so forth. Uh, and then we have a long list of potential funders that Library Strategies is going to begin targeting now that they have the ability to actually fundraise for this entity. Um, and I don't think I've shared those documents with the commission on the commission website, but we'll do so as soon as we uh, have those available to move forward. So really exciting progress there. The, the, the plan is to have um, the state librarian and one commissioner at, yes. serve on the uh, foundation board as uh, as ex officio. As ex, ex officio, mm -hmm. have, have, has this commission discussed um, how that commissioner would be would be selected? <clears throat> 
We have not discussed it as a commission, no. Can I, can I suggest that it's on the agenda for some future meeting? Sure. Okay. What are the terms of the members? Is it for for the that new board? That's one of the questions that they'll talk about when they look at the bylaws. So that's yet to be decided. And and I would be really interested in in hearing Stu's input on that. For the terms of the board. Uh, no, no, for for which uh, um, uh, what he thinks the most helpful mm -hmm. uh, way of the commission okay. ha uh, uh, having one of our members okay. uh, appear on that. I'm, I'm not volunteering, by the way. I'm just uh, I just think we should we should since you're doing such a great mm -hmm. job with the, with the, mm -hmm. with the non commission member that we should be ready. Mm -hmm. You know his guidance to us in. Uh, attracting board members are um, look for people of influence and affluence. But influence, affluence, and effluence, wasn't it? That's a lot. <laughs> that sounds like your ear edition. Yeah. <laughs> there, there could be some, um, it, it could be difficult to have a commissioner on there, dep depending on what the term is, mm -hmm. because of the way our mm -hmm. terms are set. And it, it may be a situation where we can write into the bylaws that, you know, that there's a an annual or biannual appointment or reauthorization from this commission. I don't know that we would necessarily have to yeah. be, uh, have to follow their bylaws. That would, that would be another place where we could get guidance from Stu. I think we would almost have to do mm -hmm. something like that. Probably, yeah. I mean, there may be a wonderful serendipitous situation where somebody can serve for consecutive mm -hmm. years, but unusually probably. All right. Any, any questions for me? Anything I didn't bring up that you wanted to talk about? Okay. I think we can go on to the on-call policy. Okay. Um, just a reminder, the on-call policy, you've seen it now at three meetings. Uh, we had hoped to have action at your uh, October commission meeting, but um, due to technical difficulties, the actual policy itself wasn't available for you to review, so we tabled the agenda item. So uh, again, the, the policy is just an update to a policy that we've had. We uh, chose not to extend uh, on call for Montana Shared Catalog staff as was originally proposed back in June, and instead now those staff are not serving in an on call capacity because of the support they're receiving through the vendor uh, with their cloud-based service offerings. And so largely what is included in the ONCO policy now is just a, an update cleanup of the language and to correct some inconsistencies. So I hope that we can just um, move action on the policy. I move for adoption as stated in draft. Second. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Anne. All those in favor, please vote by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, Tracy, if you are ready to talk about the NAC. Yeah. So the Network Advisory Council met in It was a really good meeting. We spent a lot of time talking about LSTA because, of course, that's the primary way library development is funded. I asked them to start brainstorming some ideas for spending some LSTA 19 funds because we will have some al unallocated funds. Typically, you know, I present the budget to them in, in March or in May, depending on when we you know, are, no, are notified of our award. And I wanted to kind of get out ahead of that and give people some thinking time because we might have this funding. So we spent some time discussing that. 
I also asked them for some assistance on defining success for our LSTA five-year plan, just kind of to get clarity so that I'm making sure that we're working on projects that are meeting the needs of Montana librarians and the people who use libraries. And then we talked about kind of this concept of the Montana library card, and we just thrown it out there something that has been in the Montana Code annotated. It's right now it's worded as statewide interlibrary access program. It used to be called a statewide library card. And we brought it to the table because some of our groups in the Montana library community have taken down the walls and are kind of acting like connected libraries. And so we just wanted to sort of see what the network advisory council members thought of it. And I think it was an interesting discussion. I kind of came back to saying, well, maybe we need to come back to saying, do we agree on the vision? Do we agree that there's value in resource sharing? And there, is there value in a Montana being able to walk into any library and be able to use those services? And so I think that will come back and we'll be in the discussion. For your meeting today, I bring to you the remainder of the unallocated federal fiscal year 2018 funds. I want to publicly thank Melissa. She really helped me with this. It's such a relief to me to have that second set of eyes <laughs> as um, we work on this together. And so you will notice that the budget I presented to you, all of the funds are now allocated. I've been doing this long enough now. I know that will probably change due to circumstances and I might be back. But I'm coming forward with a request for um, up to $10,000 for a private vendor solution to handle the public library statistics. We were able to do this in-house, but with the budget cuts and a retirement, we actually lost all of our staff who knew how that internal system worked. And I haven't been able to prepare the reporting for libraries and they really miss it. And so there are private vendors who specialize in this because every public library in every state has to do this for the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And so we would like to just pursue a private vendor because right now we don't really have the capacity to build that into Aspen. And I would like to, for the librarians to get their reports and for it to be a good experience for them since we do require this amount. And then we are also requesting up to $1,000 for print materials. Jennifer Burnell, the director of the Montana Memory Project, does have her ambassador's program up and running. And she would really like to have her ambassadors be able to leave behind and give out uh, print materials to just kind of raise awareness of the Montana Memory Project and have kind of takeaways for people who do attend their sessions. So, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about this request. I have a question, Tracy. With that being, uh, with 10,000 being allocated for the for that project. That means it would go to RFP? Nope, that is not the threshold for an RFP. That's a limited solicitation process. Okay. What is, do you know what the threshold is? It's 25,000. Okay, so so that's well below. So are there are there Montana companies that do this? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Yeah, so it would asked, be possible. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So most state libraries either use one of these two vendors or they have an in-house system. Okay. And so that would be ongoing costs that you would add to LSTA funds. Yes. yes. This isn't a question, but to, to the commissioners, I'm, I'm your representative on the Network Advisory Council. My, my, my thoughts about the Montana Library card are probably fairly obvious. But, but um, my, the question I keep gravitating more towards, uh, rather than thinking about it in terms of people being able to walk into any library and use their stuff. I'm, I'm thinking it doesn't exclude that, but when I think the way I think about it is that everyone in Montana has sort of equal opportunity for library resources, for content services, equal opportunity. So that's the corner, that's that's the, I'm coming, it's a, just the other side of the coin I know. But if, if you have thoughts about that and you want to talk to me about that, um, uh, I will I will uh, incorporate your 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 sort of perspective to that. Um, the other thing, at some point, uh, Madam Chair, you may want to think about another NAC uh, advisor uh, as well. Although I'm happy to con continue doing that, but um, 
might be good to take and get other perspectives involved in that as well. But I'm, I'm thinking about opportunity, not about the mechanism. We've had this discussion. Because I just don't think it's equal. I don't think everyone does have the same opportunity. I think people do need it. Yeah, the question is, do we all agree on that? Or how many of us agree about the equal opportunity? What would, what, what would be the argument against that? Well, Jenny and some staff and I have had an interesting conversation about that. I, I think when you, when you present it that way, everybody says, well, yeah, we do agree with that. And, and part of the reason I brought it in the format I did my experience from when I was a consultant was when you share the details with people, that's when it makes them pause and step back and say, mm -hmm. I might agree with that philosophy, but I don't know that I agree with it to the extent that I would participate in this effort. The, the <laughs> argument I've heard against it, to answer your, your question, Ken, is um, uh, an economic argument. Um, our community. Uh, our community supports libraries um, lavishly, and this other community uh, barely supports them at all. Um, it's being paid for locally, so therefore our people have um, uh, an inherent right to those resources, and tough luck to the other folks. Well, they don't usually say tough luck to the other folks, <laughs> but that's applied. It's a silent tough luck. Good luck. He's yeah. such a nice guy. <laughs> so I, I think that's, that's the argument I've heard, and I actually heard that from a public librarian. Yep. That, that's a big part of the argument that we hear. I think, you know, what, how I view us pursuing this idea, and, and I think we need to even move away from calling it the statewide library card, because that's one of those details that can, can cause this discussion to break down. You know, I think this idea of, well, is everybody going to have the same library card, and, and is it going to be branded to my library, is a detail that we just, we just don't even need to talk about. Uh, but it, it really is a, a philosophical view of um, equal access, equal opportunity. I think there's uh, some refining that we need to do to, in our thinking and our messaging about what this is. But, but uh, as we then think about our leadership role as the state library, I think there will be opportunities for us to talk about best practices around um, library policies and practices and and certainly funding and collection development and and all of those kinds of areas that um, put this kind of vision into reality and and we can provide guidance and consulting and professional development and hopefully financial and and other kinds of resources to that effort um, you know we don't we don't always have a stick, but we can I think in the future think about how our public library standards support this kind of vision and and you know re really begin thinking about this as what we mean by our our useful information infrastructure that it's not just about the state library's useful information infrastructure, it's about Montana's infrastructure and all of the components that go into supporting that. The other part that would be interesting to be to be able to have the opportunity to participate in is a discussion with somebody who knows what they're talking about, um, uh, like a Supreme Court justice, uh, about what in the Bill of Rights section of our Constitution applies to this sort of notion that everyone has equal opportunity, or am I just making that up, or people like who who use that argument just making that up? I don't think I don't think we are, but I, but but it would be interesting to have that discussion because I don't think it's just a question of philosophy. I, well. It's a philosophical discussion, but I think it's rooted in 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 our constitution. That's a good point. Evan looks like he's. I guess I'm wondering if you considered my district catalog. Sorry, that that's a, yeah. It feels yeah. like that in control yeah. has already been, you know, the people that have bought it. That's what we did. We yeah. brought it to the okay. back. It had that component. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I think I, you know, Bruce and I had an interesting exchange about this in that you know, library development staff do believe in equal opportunity. And and when you start from there, we were thinking about what seasons for Montanans. And that's kind of what built the document that I shared with the Network Advisory Council. And so that what would be easiest for Montanans is to use the shared catalogs infrastructure and platform. And to certainly start there. But I wanted to bring the conversation to the NAC because they represent 
all types of libraries and libraries that aren't in the MSC. And the truth is, Montanans are mobile. They move around. They, they, you know. That's what you meant by that. Yes. I, I mean, so it's not just physical access. I mean, it is also digital access. And it's also, the NAC had said, you know, wouldn't it be cool if someone from birth to the end of life, as they work through all these different libraries, if we were all connected and we all thought about that transition from the school library to the public library to the academic library to maybe a special library like a hospital library or a historical society. And this was my effort to kind of begin to push that conversation, to force ourselves to think about what would that look like? But I started with the MSC as a concrete thing because that's sort of like a really good picture thing to talk about that transition. And, and, and Tracy thinks about things from the concrete to the general. I think about things from the general to the concrete, which makes for sort of a cyclical conversation, but it's good stuff. Well, actually, I'm not sure that's totally true. No? Okay. I think there are three people, three kinds. So Bruce always says concrete to general, and he's general to concrete. There's a third group of people, of which Bob Cooper and I are in that third group. We start in the middle and connect the two of you as best we can. Perfect. That's thank you. Job. Thank you for your good work. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think, you know, one of the things that we'll need to think about is <clears throat> How do we incentivize libraries to join the shared catalog? And if, if there's some, you know, paleological non-knowledge reason that a board is not going to join the shared catalog, how do we help to bridge that for a period of time until that library will join the shared catalog or, you know, something like that? And then, I, I, you know, I absolutely see opportunity for us to think about the Montana spatial data infrastructure and the other kinds of, of data resources that uh, we're responsible for as part of just this ubiquitous information access that, that we're talking about. And I don't think that people, I don't think libraries should have to join the shared catalog because I, I, I don't see the university system doing that, but I want access to their stuff. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, and so and vice versa. And suspect. so then it's a matter of thinking about, you know, when we think about the shared catalog, it is a platform and it's standards based. And for that reason it makes it so much easier for us to connect libraries and resources and, and you know, libraries to libraries share resources and patrons and all of that. So it's about it's about the platforms and the standards more so than the shared catalog. And I, I think we can have the same kinds of conversations with with trails and others. And I think I think that's I think it's a fundable argument as we as we start to break down the pieces of what this looks like into funding arguments. Then I think I think there's some funding to be had, and that was one of the conversations we had at the Government Affairs Committee is, you know, we might talk about funding Montana Library to Go, but can we talk about funding Montana Library to Go as the as a piece of this larger picture of, of what this means? It's exciting. I have a question about the <clears throat> Montana Memory Project. Mm -hmm. Is there still an advisory board for the MMP? Um, not the one that there used to be. It's more through the Big Sky Country Digital Network. And that's kind of where I'm wondering is, I think we've, we maybe have a little bit of a marketing problem mm -hmm. distinguishing MMP from ESCDM, yeah. both of which get harvested by DPLA. It's, that's a very good point. It's difficult, I think, for people to understand. Mm -hmm. And this is, I mean, this is promotional materials for MMP, but um, we're not doing anything really to promote the Big Sky Country Digital Network. Yeah, you know, that would be a really interesting thing to discuss if there's a separate meeting that's coming up. Are you able, are you on that committee? Okay. Which, which committee? Um, the Big Sky Country Digital oh, Network. Oh, that one, yes, I am on that one. Yeah. <laughs> I because I do agree that that is very confusing for people. Like, because right now we're treating that as a way to aggregate material from the MMP in you, your institution at UM and soon North Dakota, um, which is pretty powerful. But I, I think it would be a very interesting conversation to talk about how do we get a raise awareness of that and how does that fit in with DPLA and some of the Digital Public Library of America's recent decisions. Who, who do you think the stakeholders are that we would market to? 
Well, if you're marketing MMP, then you're just marketing a piece mm -hmm. of the overall uh, digital collections that, mm -hmm. that we offer as a state, right? Yeah. So it's not a matter of who you're marketing to. I mean, I think you're marketing to the, to the same people, but it, it's not. It, it's just a piece of it right now. It's not marketing the whole thing. And the relationship with DPLA is, I, I think, something that has to be discussed at that meeting. I was, I was considering sending Wendy a, a message to put that on the agenda because we we bought membership into DPLA with the consideration that we would review that membership after a year. Mm -hmm. I think it's been three years now, maybe, and. We haven't really had that hard, hard discussion about is this worth it? Because the numbers are quite low. Mm -hmm. the, the analytics that we get from DPLA don't show a lot of referrals mm -hmm. to be a CDM. So is it really worth it to do that? And the overall problem with aggregated projects like this in general is that, and this is what DPLA suffers from itself, is Google and other search engines have no interest in indexing them because they just look at them as link farms because they don't have the items. I think this is this is this is a this is representative of the situation we see across the board in um, uh, public libraries and academic libraries and the digital projects that we create. We do a lot of aggregation, but those aggregations suffer from very low use because the, the search engines don't have any interest in indexing aggregations and then that's left to the, the, the SEO is then left to the individual repositories and they do a really uh, not good job at that. So the or very is, inconsistent. So it's still dark. Incredibly dark. You see this with institutional repositories in academia too. I mean, there are 4,000 of them across the world. They all suffer from tremendously low use because we've built the same thing over and over and over again. We don't get a lot of uptake from faculty putting their publications into them. We're not taking advantage of cloud-based systems like you and I have talked about many times. We should be building, all contributing to a, a single system. Then we get the attention of search engines and we give a hell of a lot of traffic. Right. Sorry, totally off off the track of what you're presenting here, which I'm very supportive of. But I wonder if you are, if you're, if you're, if you're advertising the the, the memory, it, you know, maybe at least consider rather than um, advertising the service, maybe take a teeny, a, a, a kind of a little vertical slice out of it and say, so if you're looking for stuff about trout, these are the places that you look. I, I mean, I don't know that's some, not a marketer, but but. But that, that would let us take and incorporate these various these various sources and, and talk about solving a specific problem. I don't know what that problem would be. I can't try it on my ear. But. Well, no, I think that's a very interesting question, Kennedy, and it's one I've had with the Sky Country Digital Network. What do we define as success? Um, where are we trying to go? And, and what's best for the people who are looking for this information? And I. I'm not sure we figured out we have the answer to that yet, but I also know that nationally and probably internationally, there are lots of libraries struggling. I think it would be a very good discussion if we just have a meeting. Okay, I'll send Wendy a message. Okay. Well, do we have a motion to approve the unallocated funds for? The 2018 LSTA. Okay. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Kenny. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Passes. Thank you, guys. All right, so I think you're still up on, on deck. Yeah, this is mainly uh, an FYI for you. Um, the Montana Shared Catalog Executive Board was very supportive of our request to freeze the application process. Normally, that comes up right after the 1st of January. And 
you know, we do have two reasons for doing this. The, the one is to, Kara and I have a meeting coming up to just talk about our strategy for trying to figure out the, the workload over time. It's just kind of become a little unsustainable. We're exploring a lot of different options and then we've reached out to the OPI to kind of talk about support for school libraries because they're big users of the shared catalog and we don't have <coughs> staff for them. And then I also, you know, just from past experience when we're adding a large library like the Lewis and Clark Library System, that takes a lot more time. It's very, very nice for staff to be able to focus on that and then keep the ongoing stuff going. And so for that reason, we just want to ask for the freeze and the executive board agreed with this and I'm mainly just bringing this for your information so that you are aware should you get any questions. Karen and I really want to open the process back up again and what would be FY 2020. So how we, many libraries do you anticipate will be disappointed by this? You know, I asked Kara, she's online. Kara, if you happen to know it, as I recall you said there were two, but I can't remember if I'm remembering correctly. So she is online. Go ahead. We had an we had an inquiry from a small school library that was considering the shared catalog as an option for automation. Uh, but they have been informed that we are not going to open the application process for this coming year. What, what prompted the Lewis and Clark uh, Library to um, join the shared catalog? John left like, mm -hmm. a long time. I, <laughs> I, you know, I think um, they felt like the time was right. It was something. You know, I know John was very interested in. He had been in the shared catalog library. He'd been in partners. He'd seen what he did for his patrons. And I think he wanted to offer that service um, at the Lucent Park Library. <coughs> so uh, as he worked with his staff and talked with them, he uh, definitely, they, they sort of felt like the time was right that was the shared catalog. All the concerns they had about the beginning stages of the shared catalog had been addressed. And so does that that means they're they're giving up a system that they're on now? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Well, that's great. Mm -hmm. And just just to make sure I understand this, so this the school library um, that was considering the shared catalog as an alternative, had had we not closed it up, would they have complicated would they, would they have stressed staff? to beyond what was reasonable? I don't think that one single library would have, and the staff were a little bit divided about whether or not to close the application process for this year, but I feel strongly, and I think Tracy supports this opinion, that we are already understaffed for a consortium of this size, and I want to draw attention to this fact that their workload has surpassed sustainable levels. We are already at a backlog of weeks in responding to tickets, um, not even considering projects where we're trying to be proactive and get ahead and do what's right for the existing members. So adding additional projects to this coming year didn't make a lot of sense uh, to me. And we would like to take this year to try to right scale our capacity for serving the existing members and bringing on new members. So I, and I, that, that makes perfect sense um, to me. Um, um, I'm thinking of a couple things. One, one is a communications thing. Um, seems like we should probably make sure that we're communicating that to, to people so they understand that we're, we're we, we haven't become unwelcoming. We're just, we're just kind of regathering um, our the troops. The, the other thing is what are we doing this year to take in, in right scale our capacity. So that's what we think about with Karen and sitting down and brainstorming. Things we've begun to do are, um, as I mentioned, reaching out to OPI to see about the possibility of something. Even if they can only give us, if there's some sort of grant opportunity, that could be a bridge. Uh, the second thing are things like the acquisitions pilot project, which is building a set of standards that's reduces the workload for staff members as well. Um, and then, you know, we've begun brainstorming some ideas for some possible ways of funding to try and increase the number of staff. 
I, I would say that the members that I have talked to have been very supportive. The existing members, they really see value in this, and they're very appreciative that we are, we're saying, you know, we need to pause for a moment and, and figure out how to best serve the membership and any new libraries that we add. And I'm grateful for that. I realize that's the membership. That's not libraries that might be interested. But I was supportive of Kara's proposal because I think if you're going to add new libraries, you need to be able to provide great service mm -hmm. and a really high quality product. And that's what we want to do um, so that the people who use libraries have great services, Good. which they do have right now. No, I understand. But would, would, it, would it be inappropriate for, for the commission to respectfully ask for some sort of a, of a plan to do all this in some sort of reasonable time frame? Mm -hmm. No, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, because, because I feel nothing but support for what you're doing and in, in for the for the pause, uh, and for, but but you know the, the the shared catalog is our statewide library card and it is the embodiment of ma many of our, our hopes and dreams, and um, uh, I think it's important that it still appears to be an open thing for all libraries in the state. Um, uh, you know, with still five or six hundred that aren't members, and uh, 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 don't panic, Kara. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 my guess is that at some point that you'll be coming to the commission with permission to do something different or f with need for more money or for something and we need to do our job as well uh, and i think it's of uh, the utmost importance and so okay. all possible speed of it is great and if there's something the commission can do to help with this process i think we should do we should do so yeah i mean to give perspective and Kara, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we currently have four staff members for a consortium of this size. You typically have about 15. Oh, well, you guys are doing so. fabulous work. Mm -hmm. I believe you're overextended. That has to change by either getting more money and more people or by being more efficient or both, I suspect, which is what we'll do. Above. All of the above. And yeah. so as those plans kind of coalesce, I, I look forward to seeing them and doing what we can do to help to make those real. I support the freeze, and I, I but I was um, when and when I read the mem the memo, it was clear to me that this isn't permanent. That um, because you talk about um, exploring options and um, looking at the structure, but I wonder if there could be six months, you know, just a report back on on how that's going, or I don't know what a reasonable time frame would be because you never know when options are going to present themselves. So you can't, you know, we, you can't put a date on it. That's impossible. But just to have an update on maybe in six months if you have found, you know, if you have found any solutions or options or what kind of restructuring you have done would be would be helpful. I would love to see kind of a, a, a not an extensive report, but sort of a sketch of what could be done. Maybe instead of calling it a freeze, which is such a harsh word, we should call it a temporary pause. Which is so much softer. <laughs> yeah, I would absolutely like to have something material to bring to the members' meeting in the spring, and would like to share that with the commission as well. Thanks, Kara. And I would just like to um, commend. The four staff members, um, you know, we recently did the onboarding process a couple weeks ago. Um, they were extremely attentive and um, they were very open to helping us. Um, but I could see this the strain because they weren't 100% with us. They were answering tickets as they were doing training. So, you know, one person would be at the front and the other three would be answering tickets in the back. Um, but I do feel like um, we did have one fairly major misstep, um, but it's survivable. So, um, you know, I do feel like they were very supportive of us and our, our learning capacity. So thank you, Kara, for your staff. They were great. Um, so yeah, we we will be um, we will be doing rebarcoding a second time. Oh my god! <laughs> a very major misstep. Um, something that um, we'll be able to fund it, but um, 
It was really sad. <laughs> no, I, I told Erin and she's got an able crew. Yeah, I um, and people at the college are also really excited to maybe help with the rebarcoding project. So perhaps in late May, um, we can have a party and host people to just sleep on the floor in the library and maybe we could go for a hike, um, have a cookout, something to get it done as soon as possible, but you know, with as many hands on deck would make it much easier. I've never been to a barcode party. Oh, it's <laughs> oh, Bruce and I have. Bruce and I have. You see my stick. So it would make it much easier for us. Um, we probably put in about 100 man hours. Um, and then, um, you know, so hopefully this is also a learning tool for the, the share calendar trainers to make sure that this doesn't happen to somebody who can't absorb, you know, absorb that kind of hit. So um, I'm very lucky that I actually have a little extra funding this year. So um, it made possible partly by joining the shared catalog. So yeah, um, it was, it was sad, but we will roll with it. And it's not something that has to be Corrected immediately, so that was helpful. Better than barcoding your library. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> much better than a, a larger library. So thank you guys, and I I do think that um, you know I could see the strain on the trainers um, as the entire staff of the shared catalog came to my library for onboarding. Um, to me, that doesn't make a ton of sense. You know, to only have four people. Therefore, they all have to go. I know some of it was their training as well, but um, you know, it, I can definitely see how um, they need more support. So, I definitely support having the freeze and and finding something that will um, will really support our staff to in return support um, the libraries who are on the shared catalog. So you have a couple of comments online just along with that. First from Kara saying, welcome Erin and B BFCC. Can't read it. But. And then Jill Flick says she volunteers to help with your party. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> well, valuable learning experience for her. Okay. That would be great. And more people can see my library. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, and and Joe, are you ready? Or did you have anything else that you would like to? Okay, thank you, Tracy. And then, if you are ready, Anne and Joe, to talk about um, internship and practicum. Sure. Is it a Joe? Could I just give a little history and? I I think about? you should definitely start, Anne. Go ahead. Okay. So. Um, we in higher ed we send out for the um, candidate teacher librarian candidates we send them out to do practicum experiences we call it practicum on the U of side and i believe the msu side calls it internships um, and so we would love for them to be able for the site supervisors who accept those students to be able to get state library continuing education credits um, i think i first asked the question in about 2014 um, and we also asked the OPI for, for the same thing um, and the OPI was pretty quick to grant that so your teacher librarians who accept practicum students who have very specific they're not volunteers they're not people who are shelving they're doing very specific projects and the um, supervisors are taking time to help mentor and develop them um, the OPI was pretty quick to agree to that because you already had a, a structure in place, a mechanism in place to grant continuing education units for your um, supervising teachers, teacher librarians. Um, but we weren't as quick on the, the MSL side because um, it was in the policy that um, inter supervising internships wasn't and wasn't a way to to obtain continuing education credits. And so it's taken a while to sort of propose um, 
how to think about how that might work and propose how we might do that. So this month, we're just talking about it, and then we'll hopefully turn that into an action item for the next meeting. Um, our public life. Most, uh, I, I would say about 90% of our students in the uh, on the undergraduate level are practicing teachers. So they are already in the school. And so that means that most of them take the practicum class in the summer, and we match them in public libraries. So we have um, teacher librarians doing their practicums in public libraries. And we make that work largely by um, including them in the, the summer reading programs. So we try to, and it's a K through 12 endorsement, so we need them to work with every grade level. Um, and so we make that work. And what the university does is they give them a stipend similar to what, well, much less than, but similar in a similar way to what a, um, um, somebody who is supervising a student teacher would have a stipend. So what we're doing right now is offering them, the site supervisors, the mentors, either a stipend or continuing education units from OPI. We would like to also be able to have the option of granting them credits continuing edu education credits for their MSL certifications. So that's what Joe and I have been working on, um, and that's something that we needed to bring to you specifically because it does say in, in the continuing education rules as they are right now that we, that, that isn't an acceptable way to earn continuing education, but it is a fabulous experience for the site supervisors to have, um, a, to, to mentor a new person. Um, and so we kind of took the o OPI model that we're already using and talked about how that could apply to our public librarians who would choose MSLCE if they aren't certified teachers. Um, right now, even though stipends are offered to the public librarians who accept practicum students, most of them aren't able to take it because of union rules. Um, so most of the public librarians who do mentor our new teacher librarians are um, just doing it from the, the kindness of their hearts, um, which, which is great. But we would also like to be able to recognize that they're participating in a valuable learning experience and to grant them some um, CE units for that. And so that leads me to um, Joe contacted me and said, you know, remember this thing we've been talking about for a long time, let's talk about it some more. And we actually um, took some time. She took me through um, an exercise, and we've had a couple of meetings. And, and I'll turn it over to Joe from there. Well, thank you, Anne. That was a lot of, that was terrific background. And I just want to reemphasize that it, this, this came up and was brought to my attention again. Um, in August when I first presented to all of you about um, about the pilot program that we're currently running to provide CE credit um, outside of the current pathway that we have which is really focused on formal learning experiences and formal kind of classroom based learning experiences so the pilot project brought up this kind of issue and and when I first started to investigate it further with Anne I, I thought we were going to talk about a very informal learning experience but what I quickly learned was that the way that these internships or practicums are structured is quite formal you know it's under the uh, guidance of a member of the college faculty uh, there's a specific period of time involved there's documentation involved there's a structured kind of not exactly a curriculum or a syllabus in that way but um, but activities between the supervisor and the um, and the student the practicum student so um, that kind of reformed a little bit my ideas about how we ought to go about this and since that there was already a model at OPI for um, providing credit it, it seemed, I mean, quite obvious to me that that we should really pursue this. And while Anne's motivation, I think, might be as a way to, you know, motivate or incentivize um, 
libraries to take on students. My motivation is to is to really push our librarians to do significant, rigorous, but varied learning activities. And and I really um, have come to view this. Um, activity is certainly fitting into that. So we also went on, so Anne and I went on um, after we went through a theory of tr change model, which we've done a lot at the State Library the past few years to kind of investigate new projects and why or how we might go forward. And the theory of change model is really useful to um, kind of inform how that the logic models that we used to, to as planning tools to determine what our outcomes are. So we've shared those documents with you and we've also shared them with um, Ann Eubank and Taba Smathers to get their input um, and so that's where we are right now. We're, we're, um, I'm prepared to, pro to propose that we that we actually add this as a formal learning um, opportunity for our people who are seeking certification and I'm I'm very interested in your questions and feedback. And Jenny has some um, has also provided some suggestions for us to um, address in what will be the final proposal that we submit to you next time. The floor is yours. Well, I think it's great having collaboration between school librarians and the public librarians. Um, you know, in the neck, that was sometimes a um, communication of, but how do you get the school librarians to collaborate? Um, and so as new teacher librarians come on board, this is a great way to show what library resources, you know, to promote a continuum of information resources um, through a lifetime, you, you know, it should become routine for kids to want to be in their school library and then when that's not open to go to their public library. And, you know, again, I think that really leads towards con not conditioning, but but having a public who feels confident in going into any library and saying, I want to use your resources. I think that's a piece that I haven't heard in the state library card is um, as librarians, we can agree, but how do we get our public to feel empowered enough to say, I'm going to come for Browning and go into Helena and feel confident enough to go into their library, or I'm coming from my school library and going into the, you know, community college library for, for information. Um, so I think it's a really good idea and I love the partnership between the two different library entities because that's the only way something like a state library card will actually be successful because we can make our arguments on our side but if the users aren't using it, you know, um, then what did we do the work for or did we miss a step by getting their input? So, um, you know, and school librarians are a big part in teaching kids how to use public libraries. Um, so I really love the idea of having, you know, more opportunity to um, to support both sides, you know, getting the certification for the teacher librarians and then for um, giving incentive to public librarians or, you know, the certified librarians to host, um, host a teacher librarian in the summer. Um, I think it's a great idea, um, reading a little bit about it before the meeting. I'm excited to, to give some incentive if people can't take a stipend to say there's, there's another way to, <laughs> to have an incentive to do this. Um, so thank you, Anne and Joe, for, for moving forward with this. So, so we'll see next next meeting. Will it be at sort of, is this at the arm level or is this just a? The commission adopted the last 
update to the uh, continuing education program and the, the CE manual. So I'm envisioning that this will be some kind of addendum to that. Yeah, I, I've, I've started to work on actual page that we would add to the CE manual. Um, and and that that's where the, you know, kind of the, the rubber meets the road in terms of figuring out, um, you know, exactly what counts and what doesn't count count because you know we know what Anne's program is like but maybe we don't know what you know you if UW wants to place a, um, a practicum student at a library in Montana we have to account for um, for that for that as well so we're trying to create a some language in the CE manual that really clarifies what we expect for these situations where it's it's not just a a student shows up and says, hey, I want to work in your library and um, I'm doing an independent study. We're looking at for something that's pretty structured, um, that the library has a, that, that relationship with that faculty member is um, really secure and that there's, you know, documentation involved. And, um, and I will note that I think that there's a natural, we've been discussing back and forth about well if somebody does this every summer can they just get credit every summer when it's new people but a lot of the same kind of um, maybe a very similar learning experience and um, I think this some of those issues are kind of taken care of by the structure of the CE program already so we've got to we've got to talk all that through and um, I'm looking forward to having those discussions with Ann and Jenny and Tracy and um, so we'll have some specific language to share with you next time. There are a few sticky situations to address. This definitely broadens the scope of what CE would be offered for, um, for as compared to the document that the commission last adopted. Um, it's recognizing other types of professional development. Um, by doing this. And then, you know, I have, I'll use Susie McIntyre as an example, although there are several around the state of people who take many, many, many practicum students. And how do you deal with that? There are, most people will take one practicum student a year at tops, but, um, you know, she might take four. Um, Missoula might take four, I left, you know, Billings took three last semester. So um, how do you deal with, you can't, you know, with people who are taking on multiple students and not necessarily providing extremely different experiences. So we want to be sure that we're not um, giving duplicate credit. Right. For this. We, and we don't, I mean, I think my goal is, is always to m move our learners toward more rigor and, um, and, and I think actually see this as a very rigorous learning experience partly because of what I've learned from Anne about how structured it is. I, like I said, I don't view it as an informal learning experience like we are um, suggesting librarians can do under the pilot project. Um, I, I see it because of its structure, because there's a faculty member um, who is in charge of it and because of the documentation involved and the time period involved, a, a set time period, I see it as a formal learning experience for our learners. Um, I think that's debatable, but that's how I see it, or I've come to see it. And I certainly didn't start this process believe, um, thinking that way. So, you know, I think I think it's worth um, considering within the structure of our regular pathway for CE. And, um, but again, the, the new pathway, as we start discussing that more, would certainly provide an, a way for people to figure out to get credit this for doing stuff like this but um, I'm kind of, kind of of the mind that it should be available to any librarian no matter which pathway they're using to get their CE in the future so we'll have some more discussion about that and we just wanted to bring you up to date that we you know really were had made some progress and um, pretty serious about bringing you a, a, a formal proposal very soon Thank you, Anne. Um, thank you, Joe, very much. Um, You're welcome. So, thinking about time, 
Um, we did start a little late, so I would like to actually do the next action. So asking Jim to talk about the final state publication depository program before we worry about lunch. So if you would like to begin, Jim. Is the, sorry, is the previous proposal one that we have to vote on? Um, yeah, no, so. we kind of were wanting to know if you had any questions or anything that we, you know, that we would then address and then we'll bring an action item back. Additional new questions. You've seen the the draft rules. We had the one addition uh, bit from commission discussion at your October meeting about making sure that in the section about uh, state agencies' responsibilities that uh, what are determined to be state publications have to be posted on publicly accessible websites. So that addition was made. Uh, there was a question during the comment period from Bruce about whether or not we needed to define state publications. And so for your reference, uh, that definition is included in Montana code. So I've, I've included that information in your meeting materials. Uh, it was opened through the public comment period through the Secretary of State's office. We didn't receive any other uh, public comments. So uh, we presented the uh, rule notice adoption notice um, for you, for your materials. And at this point, we're recommending adoption of these rules. I, I, my questions were certainly um, answered and my uh, concerns were satisfied. And I would move for the adoption um, as stated. Second it. Thank you, Bruce and Ken. Um, any other discussion? Hearing none, um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Looks like the motion is passed. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Great stuff. Okay. And I'll just remind the commission that this addressed, it wasn't a finding, it was a, just a, a note in our last audit about making sure that we had these rules and, and so this formalizes that process and we can make that apparent to auditors in the future. So for lunch, a working lunch? We, I what, think that, yeah. what do you guys think of working lunch? We have Carl here, okay. um, so he could do his presentation while the commission is eating, if, if that's what you prefer. Yeah, I think that would be great. Yeah, so let's take a few minutes and grab our plates, and then we will introduce Carl. And, and Carl,